Okay, so I was going to talk about kind of a, a selection of topics. So um, let's see. So, you know, a lot of the time in my lab, we, uh, you know, we work very closely with experimental neuroscientists to understand how various neural circuits work. So, for example, how do animals see? How does a fly detect motion? You know, how do mice navigate? You know, in particular, why do they have these hexagonal grid cells in their brain? How do monkeys reach? Uh, how do mice learn? But if we kind of step back from all of this work, uh, right, we're all kind of, you know, th th there's very many, many reasons for kind of a very interesting alliance between theoretical neuroscience and theoretical machine learning and even applied machine learning. And that alliance is motivated by the following kind of logic, which is, you know, we're all, a lot of us are in this game because we'd like to understand uh, how, how the brain works and, and maybe re and recreate the capabilities of the brain in artificial systems. Um, but what does that even mean to understand how the brain works? Well, a proximal version of that question is we'd, we'd like to understand how the connectivity and dynamics of the neural circuit gives rise to behavior. And also uh, learning is very important. We'd like to understand how neural activity and synaptic learning rules conspire to self-organize useful connectivity that subserves behavior. But what, what's interesting is that the field of machine learning has generated lots of really, really interesting learned neural networks that accomplish very, very difficult functions, functions that we know of no other way of doing in any artificial system at all uh, at the moment. Um, and, and what's scary for neuroscientists is, is that we know uh, everything about these systems. We know we can do any experiment we want on them. We know their connectivity. We know their dynamics. We know their learning rule, their developmental experience. Yet we don't have a meaningful understanding of how they learn and work, nor do we have a meaningful benchmark for what such understanding would even look like. Um, so I think the two fields have a lot to learn from each other in, in, in this respect. Um, I don't think that, uh, well, okay, let me not go further than that. We, we actually just um, uh, wrote some of this up in an opinion piece uh, uh, here. So, um, so we've been working hard both for these reasons, we've been working hard both in neuroscience and in machine learning, you know, sometimes doing pure machine learning theory, sometimes doing pure experimental neuroscience collaborations. Um, and, but but it, sort of the intersection of theoretical neuroscience and, and, and machine learning, this is a set of papers that we've been working on. Interestingly, a lot of ideas from physics come into play in analyzing artificial neural networks and their biological counterparts, uh, topics such as these. I can't talk about all of this work, so I, I chose a selection. But if you're interested in sort of a, a, in our attempt to make a coherent overview of this field of work, especially on physics-based analyses of neural network theory, um, myself and my colleagues at Google, we wrote a review article uh, on this where we discussed a variety of topics, including the expressivity of deep networks, the geometry of their error landscape, signal propagation, how to initialize them, uh, generalization and deep probabilistic generative models, how to understand them. Again, all using the language and, and methods and techniques of physics. Um, but we wrote this for a general audience. Uh, um, okay, so, um, so this is a set of topics. Uh, this is kind of the outline of the talk, and I may skip one of these as, as we go along. But um, so first, we're going to start shallow. We're, we're just going to review regression uh, uh, in high dimensions, and we're going to ask what is the optimal uh, loss function and regularizer for regression. Um, and I'll, I'll say say what I mean uh, by that. Uh, then we're going to look at generalization, uh, in particular. You know, how is it that neural networks can generalize as well as they do, uh, despite being able to memorize the training examples? Um, then we'll talk about uh, interpretability in deep learning, especially coming up with models of uh, biological neural circuits that are interpretable. I'll, I'll focus more uh, basically on deriving the, the primate retina from first principles. Um, We'll, we'll basically show that an optimal, optimal convolutional autoencoder of natural movies has convolutional channels that are equivalent to the most dominant channels in the primate retina. Uh, we'll, we may touch on these hexagonal uh, grid cells in, in the brain. We've developed a mathematical theory for why hexagonal grid cell, cells are, sorry, there's somebody vacuuming upstairs. So you might be hearing that, I'm not sure. But in any case, we'll, we'll, we'll be discussing uh, a theory of why these hexagonal grid cells obligatorily exist uh, in neural circuits that are trained to path integrate or navigate. Then I'll talk about some recent work involving uh, so-called quantum neuromorphic computing. These are quantum computers that my colleagues in applied physics have built using atoms and photons, whose classical limit corresponds to a neural network. And so we can analyze the energy landscape of these uh, uh, you know, high-dimensional quantum computers. 
and try to understand uh, uh, the dynamics of these quantum computers through the geometry of their energy landscape. And this connects to ideas uh, that we looked at in terms of looking at the, the loss landscape of neural networks themselves. Um, so that's sort of the menu of items. Uh, okay, so, so let's get started. So um, uh, I, will, I will skip this slide actually. Um, so, so we know that sort of high dimensional statistics is a really interesting topic now. These are situations where you have high dimensional data, but not that many uh, examples of the data. So the number of examples is proportional to the dimensionality of the data, but the ratio is going, the ratio is order one. We actually reviewed this also through the lens of physics. Here's a review article we wrote a, a while ago, where we discussed things like learning theory, random matrix theory, random projections, compressed sensing, and so forth, all in a unified language of, of, of physics, namely replicant theory. Uh, so if you're interested in, in, in learning about that, that lens through which to view things, uh, uh, where you can often get analytic results about all of these topics, uh, um, you could try this review article if you're interested. Okay, so, so, okay, so now here's the problem okay, that we'd like, to, we'd like to attack. So we're gonna look at regression in, in high dimensions. So we're going to assume that we have some generative model of the data, and we're gonna ask the question, what's the optimal thing to do given that you have a particular generative model of the data. So what is our generative model? So we have an unknown regression vector S0, this regression vector right here, it's p-dimensional, right? So it's a p-dimensional vector. Um, we don't, of course, get direct access to this unknown regression vector. We only get indirect access through inputs, x mu, that are fed to the system. x mu is also a p-dimensional vector. You take the dot product of the true regression vector with the mu -th input, right? You add some noise to it. We assume our measurements are noise corrupted. And then we get our measurement, our output y mu here. Okay. So we get our training data generated through this process. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to estimate an s hat uh, for this unknown s0 that is as close as possible to it. What are our generative assumptions? We're going to assume a product model on the unknown uh, vector s0. So we're assuming its components are drawn iid from a particular distribution, P sub S, it's a distribution over a scalar uh, value. Um, so this is the signal distribution. It could be non-Gaussian. In fact, this problem is interesting precisely when these distributions are non-Gaussian, right? Uh, we're going to assume that we have N measurements, that so mu, the index mu goes from one to N, and we're gonna assume that the noise is drawn IID across measurements, and it comes from its own distribution, P sub epsilon, which again could be non-Gaussian, okay? So that's our generative model. Now the question is what procedure do we use to go from the training data to our estimated regression vector? Okay, so we're gonna consider a very, very large class of estimation procedures known in the statistics literature as M estimation. The basic idea is um, you have a, uh, uh, so you have your training data, you have a loss function rho and a regularizer sigma. And we're going to estimate S hat as the, as the arg min of this objective function. Rho is usually an increasing function of its argument uh, or the absolute value of its argument. So here we, we minimize over all candidate regression vectors S. X mu dot S is the prediction that you would have made if your regression vector were S. Y mu is the actual measurement that you got. So this is your discrepancy in measurement space and Rho is penalizing this discrepancy. Okay, and then you have some regularizer sigma on the unknown coefficients S. And, and the minimization of this function leads to your estimate. Okay. How are we gonna score ourselves on how well we did? Well, as theorists, we can assume that we have access to S0 and we get, we get our S hat here and we can just ask, what is the L2 discrepancy between S hat and S0? Okay. In the high dimensional statistics limit where P is going to infinity, N is going to infinity, but the ratio of the number of measurements to the number of dimensions or parameters is order one. In that high dimensional limit, this L2 error will concentrate to be close to its mean value, which I'm gonna be defined to be this. So it's dependent on the measurement density, the loss function you chose, the regularizer you chose, the noise distribution you had, and the signal distribution you had. And we'd like to ask for a given loss function and regularizer, what is the L2 error? By the way, this is monotonically related to the generalization error. But um, we're gonna ask, what is the L2 error? And second, for a given signal and noise distribution, what is the best possible loss and regularizer you could possibly choose? Okay, so th Priya, those are the questions. Shai has a, has a question for you, if you don't mind taking that now. Yeah, 
much. Of course, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, uh, you, I mean, you you motivated by things which are very realistic, like understanding the brain and neurons and the, and the primates and the visual system and so on. Oh. But then uh -huh. you take here a big chunk of assumptions which are completely unrealistic that the underlying function is, is linear, that we care about the limit to infinity of the dimension, that the, the, everything here is, is very uh, theoretical and arbitrary and detached from reality. So how will it connect back to reality? Oh, okay, I see, I see, sorry. So I, I don't mean for the first section of this talk to be a solution to the brain. I, I, I never meant to insinuate that. Right, we have a long way to go uh, there, right? There's a long pathway we need to close the gap between biology and machine learning practice and machine learning theory and, and so forth. This is just, uh, you know, it, it's one very, very small step. Uh, if you're worried about the asymptotic limit that we'll take, we'll show you that our predictions are very good for small problem sizes of n equals 100 and p equals 100 or so. Um, the, the most uh, problematic thing would be the product uh, uh, assumption in S0. But even that can be relaxed. S0 can be a fixed vector. Uh, um, then the, the, the most, then the thing that's that that's, uh, might be problematic is the IIT assumption of the noise across measurements uh, and so forth. But yeah, I apologize if I meant to convey that, that we were solving the brain in the first section of this talk. Uh, okay, we're not going to, yeah, uh, there will be other parts of this talk where we'll connect directly to the brain quantitatively, uh, but it will be the retina, right? Okay. Um, yeah. So, so this is just, uh, we're shifting gears. This is just a simple statistics problem that, that we're going to solve, but the answer is actually quite rich and interesting and instructive, uh, I, I think. We'll, we'll, we'll see, right? Okay, so, um, okay, so, so at least hopefully the, the, the question we're asking is clear. Um, all right, so just to, just to give you an example, I mean, almost all of the algorithms that we know and love are special cases of this formalism, right? So for example, least squares regression, the loss function is a squared loss, there's no regularizer. Um, ridge regression, you know, squared loss, squared regularizer. Maximum likelihood is where the loss function is the minus log probability of the, of the uh, uh, noise distribution. Map estimation is where the uh, loss is the minus log probability of the noise and the regularizes the minus log probability of the signal. And the famous lasso is another special case. So we have this embarrassment of riches here, right? And the question is, what is the best algorithm uh, you can possibly choose given these uh, assumptions of the generative model? Okay, so, um, so we worked out, uh, we worked out this, uh, uh, the answer and the answer is actually quite, interesting and, and, and simple in the end. Basically what we did was uh, we were able to solve uh, for this Q sub S analytically as a function of alpha, rho, sigma, P sub epsilon and P sub S. And then we were to minimize this as a variational uh, calculus problem on the functional form of rho and sigma to find the optimal loss on the regularizer. And we use techniques from the statistical mechanics of, of uh, condensed matter systems and quench disorder. But, Anyways, I'll leave that aside. Um, it's on the paper, but but here's an answer. So so here's a running example that I'll use. Let's say that our our, our noise distribution is Laplacian, and our signal distribution is Laplacian, right? So these are examples of non-Gaussian distributions. the The optimal thing to do depends on how many measurements you take. It turns out if your measurement density is very very large, right? Then the optimal thing to do is to do map estimation. So uh, the minus log probability of the noise is the absolute value function. The minus log probability of the signal is also the absolute value function. So math is the optimal thing to do, right? On the other hand, uh, if you reduce the amount of data that you have, so the measurement density gets lower, the optimal thing to do is to smooth the uh, loss and the regularizer in a certain nonlinear way, okay? Until the limit when you have very little data this particular nonlinear smoothing operation yields just a quadratic loss and a quadratic regularizer under certain conditions, which I'll explain next. Um, and so this is just ridge regression, right? So it turns out ridge regression is the optimal thing to do if you have very little data. Now, what are the conditions on the signal and noise for this to be true? If the signal and noise are log concave, okay? This is a technical assumption we need in our, in our, um, in our um, 
uh, calculations uh, basically so that the M estimation problem is a convex problem uh, and, and we can assume certain simple conditions about the, the, the minimum. But, but basically for any log concave signal and noise distribution, the optimal loss and regularizer are nonlinearly smooth versions of MAP where the smoothing increases as the measurement density decreases. MAP is optimal at high measurement density and ridge regression is optimal at low measurement density, completely independent of what the signal and noise distribution are as long as they're log concave. We also show that the gap between our, our algorithm and the best possible algorithm, which is simply computing the posterior mean of S given the training data uh, is zero. So this means that no inference algorithm can outperform our optimal algorithm. Mm -hmm. So let's give an example of the effect. So um, this is for the running example of Laplacian signal and noise. This is the measurement density this is the L2, the fractional L2 error. So it's between zero and one, okay? The quadratic is the, is the ridge regression and the red one is the map. The solid curves are theory generated by our analytics and the error bars come from numerical experiments with problems where N and P are of the size of order hundred. Uh, you can see that the numerical experiments concentrate very close to our theoretically predicted mean values. And you can see at, at even moderate measurement densities, MAP outperforms ridge regression. But at small measurement densities, ridge regression <laughs> outperforms MAP. And the black curve is the best possible algorithm, right? And you can see that the performance of ridge regression as predicted approaches the performance of the best possible algorithm. And uh, um, yeah, and MAP does worse, okay? So um, if you're interested in the details, uh, they can be found in this pair of papers. Here we compute uh, these, uh, you know, everything that's in this plot. And here we, sorry, in, in this paper. And then here we show that there's no gap between our algorithm and the Bayes optimal algorithm. Uh, so it, this is, in some sense, it's a way to compute high dimensional integrals by solving a high dimensional optimization problem where the high dimensional integral in question is the posterior mean. And the optimization problem in question is this uh, smooth version of map. Okay. So what's really nice about this is, uh, I think is its universality, the notion that ridge is a universal optimal algorithm at low measurement densities, regardless of your signal and noise distribution, again, assuming the product uh, uh, distribution and assuming log concave signal and noise. Importantly, this doesn't solve interesting special, interesting cases like, um, uh, you know, like sparse, uh, you know, regression with sparse priors, because uh, uh, um, like, like, for example, the spike slab prior on the unknown S0 doesn't have a log concave uh, signal distribution. So it doesn't solve that problem, right? Or what the optimal thing to do there is. Okay, so, um, okay, so that's sort of a warm up. Um, Okay, so let's talk about uh, uh, now generalization uh, uh, in neural networks. Again, this is just pure machine learning theory at the moment. We're, we're not gonna say anything about the brain yet. Okay. So this is work that was done in a pair of papers uh, uh, with Andrew Sachs, Andrew Lumpkin, and, and Jay McClellan at Stanford. And this is the pair of papers. And so, you know, what we're interested in is, you know, we're, we're all sort of interested in the dynamics of, of learning. Uh, especially in nonlinear deep networks. Um, you know, interesting things happen, like uh, the training error can be flat for a while and then it suddenly drops. So you have these plateaus. The test error can suddenly drop and then rise. Uh, so, the, so this non-monotonicity in the test error is related to overfitting and, and so forth. And, and there are various works that try to upper bound the test error and so forth. Dan Roy, has, you know, Becker's done a lot of work in this. He's pointed out that a lot of the existing bounds are vacuous in the sense that they, um, the upper bound probabilities of error, the upper bounds are bigger than one, uh, even sometimes. Um, so we would like to try to just analytically compute these entire curves, okay? And that's difficult to do in general. Um, but, but what happens is this type of nonlinear learning dynamics already shows up in deep linear networks. And, um, and so we might have a hope of, of computing things there uh, analytically, okay? And, and we might obtain generalizable lessons there uh, uh, for, uh, for other systems. So we're gonna start uh, just with a simple two weight layer linear neural network, right? 
so the so the output is just a linear function of the input. Okay. This might this of course is a terrible model for the expressivity of deep neural networks because the composition of linear functions is linear, but it's a non-trivial model of the learning dynamics. Uh, you can see that by, by just imagining that you have a squared loss of the output. So the output is the desired output minus the actual output squared. That squared loss is then quartic in the weights because you have the a composition of weights here and then a, quart, a squared loss. So then if you do gradient descent, the gradient is cubic in the weights. So if you go to the limit of very, very small learning rates uh, and large batch sizes, you can reduce the system to the, the learning dynamics to a set of ODEs or, or gradient flow equations. And as promised, the, uh, the gradient flow equations are cubic in the weights. So it's a nonlinear set of coupled ordinary differential equations. What simplifies is the statistics of the training data that drives learning. This is the input output correlation matrix or how correlated one neuron here is with another neuron across the entire training set. And then there's sigma 3, 1, the input output correlation matrix, how correlated one neuron here is with the output, uh, an output neuron here across the entire training set. So these two correlation matrices are, are the only aspects of the data that drive learning. That's where the simplicity of the linear network arises. Nonlinear networks, non -linear networks can be sensitive to high order statistics in the data, of course, in a way that we don't fully understand. Um, but, but these are the differential equations governing learning. So they're a complicated set of nonlinear ordinary differential equations, but we can find exact a class of exact solutions to these equations. And they take, a, in hindsight, they take a very simple form. If we think about the product of the weight matrices, there's a class of solutions that behave like this. If we consider the singular, so okay, so we'll actually work in a setting where the inputs are white. So sigma one, one is the identity. So the only thing that drives learning is the input output correlation matrix. And there's a special class of initial conditions where if you think about the singular value decomposition of the input output correlation matrix, these are the singular vectors. And what the neural network does is the composite input output map builds up the singular value decomposition of the input output correlation matrix mode by mode. So it has these time dependent singular values and they rise with a particular sigmoidal function. That sigmoidal function has these properties. It asymptotes as learning time goes to infinity to the actual singular value of the input output correlation matrix in the training data. But if you start, say, with small initial weights, it starts with a small value. And it does undergoes a sudden transition from a low to a small value at a certain time. Right? Uh, the time it takes to learn that singular value mode is 1 over its singular value. So stronger modes get learned earlier, okay? This is a weaker mode that gets learned later, and this is a weaker mode that gets learned even later. Now, this is a class of solutions for a very specific set of initial conditions where the product of the weights already knows about the singular vectors of the training data, but it doesn't know about the singular values. But it turns out this class of solutions is an attracting trajectory in the space of all possible initial conditions, such as if you start from random initial conditions you see this very similar behavior, okay? So just in terms of generalizable lessons, of course, in general, we would like to say that for deep nonlinear networks, stronger statistical structure in the data should get learned earlier. The problem is for deep nonlinear networks, we don't know how to quantify statistical structure and we don't know how to compute the learning time. But for deep linear networks, we know how to quantify both. The strength of statistical structure or the statistical structure in question is simply the the singular modes of the training data, input output correlations and training data, the strength of that statistical structure, the singular value, and the learning time is one over the singular value. Okay. So, um, okay. So by the way, you can generalize this to deeper, uh, deeper networks. We don't have to restrict our attention to two weight layers. We can go to arbitrary numbers of weight layers. Uh, you can find the details in the paper. And um, I will show you simulations of nonlinear networks and I'll show you that our theory kind of degrades gracefully as you add nonlinearities. Okay, now, but we need to understand, but what I wanted to do, of course, was understand generalization, not, you know, the, the, the dynamics of the training error. So to, to, to start understanding generalization, I, I wanted to give you kind of a visceral picture of the learning process. So here we've been talking so far about, so if we think about S hat as the singular value of the training data, and S is the singular value of the neural network that is learning, the composite input output map of the neural network that's learning. Uh, 
we've been plotting the singular value of the, of the learned neural network as a function of training time. And it's been rising with the sigmoidal fashion. But I could ask you to think about it in a different way. Let's plot on the horizontal axis, the singular values that are in the training set of the various singular modes in the training set. And I could ask at a particular instant of time, which singular values in the training set have been learned at that time. And if we plot that, we can measure that by the singular value of the, of the neural network divided by the singular value of the training set. This is the fraction of learning that occurs. At an early time, only the very, very large singular modes in the training data have been learned. At a later time, an intermediate set have been learned, but these have not. And at an even later time, the smallest ones have been learned. So in a ver very visceral way, you can visualize the learning process as a singular mode detection wave that sweeps in from large to small singular values and picks up uh, singular values in the training data until at, at, at very large times, every single singular mode in the training data has been learned, okay? So, so basically just the take home message is at any particular time, large modes have been learned, time modes that are greater than that time and appropriate units have been learned. Modes that are smaller than that time have not yet been learned. Okay, now let's talk about generalization. So to talk about generalization, we need to have a model of the task at hand. We need to have an entire uh, generative model for the, for the training data, data. So the way we're gonna do that is we're going to model the training data in, in a classic setup known as a teacher-student setup, we're going to assume that there's a ground truth teacher neural network, right? That generates the outputs and it's fed random inputs, okay? So, so the training data are, are random inputs, x hat mu, that are fed into the, the teacher neural network. They propagate through the teacher neural network and generate outputs, but the outputs could, could be corrupted by noise, okay? So this is a, a, our generative model of the data. We're going to assume the inputs are whitened uh, so we can apply the theory of, of our last few slides. Uh, of course, the, the, the training data depends on the teacher only through the product of the weights. So let's call that product W bar, right? So this is your training data. Now we know that by, and then we're gonna feed the training data to the student network. And we're gonna ask how well does the student network generalize on a new held out example. Okay. We're going to assume that the teacher is low rank, right? So we're gonna assume the, uh, the input, it has many, many inputs, it has many, many outputs, but the rank of the teacher is small. But the student uh, could be full rank. It doesn't know the rank of the teacher. It, it, so, so it has many more weights than it really needs in order to, in order to mimic the teacher, okay? So in some sense, it's over-parameterized. Okay, and the question is, uh, again, how can we compute the test error of the student as a function of learning time? So we, we've already shown you how to understand the, the training dynamics, right? So the, the student's training dynamics depends on the training data only through the input-output correlation matrix. We're assuming that the input-input correlation matrix is white, right? So then we can easily compute the input-output correlation matrix and it hides within it the teacher, right? The correlations between the inputs and the outputs and the training data of the student are generated by the teacher. So W bar is hiding within the input output correlation matrix, but it's been corrupted by this high dimensional noise that could, could have spurious correlations with the inputs. So there's a high dimensional random Gaussian matrix that's perturbing this low rank matrix. That's the structure of the training data. So the extent to which the student can generalize is determined by the extent to which the student can discover a low rank matrix buried within its training data, right? Okay, so what we really need to understand is we need to understand the structure of the relationship between the, teachers, uh, the teacher and the training data, right? So let's review some random matrix theory. So here's the, so we know that the singular modes of the training data are what determine the learning dynamics of the student. We'd like to understand how the singular modes of the training data are related to the singular modes of the teacher, which are the only things that are of importance to learn. And, and so let's define the singular value decomposition of the teacher to be this singular value decomposition. So anything with a bar over it reflects the singular mode structure of the teacher. Let's define the singular value decomposition of, this, of the training data to be this decomposition. So anything with a hat over it reflects the training data, 
the training data is a perturbation of this low rank matrix by a noise matrix. And we understand the relationship between S hat and S bar and U hat and U bar. And that was worked out by some random matrix theory done by uh, these people here. And there's a very nice story here that there turns out to be a phase transition in the relationship between the training data and the teacher as a function of the signal to noise. So the signal to noise is related to the variant or, or, or basically roughly we normalize things so that this, this has unit variance. And so the signal to noise ratio is roughly how large are the singular values of the teacher, okay? If the teacher, so here on the horizontal axis, we've, we've put the teacher singular values. And we can ask as a function of the teacher singular values, how correlated is the singular vectors of the training data with the singular vectors of the, of the teacher? The answer is if the teacher singular values are too small, they get buried by the noise. And there's absolutely no correlation between the training data and the teacher. The teacher is invisible in the training data. However, above a certain threshold, the singular vectors of the training data start to acquire correlations with the singular vectors of, of, the, of the teacher, right? So this, is the, this overlap is the dot product between u hat and u bar. This dot product rises and approaches one as the signal to noise ratio becomes quite large. Okay. You can also compute the, the singular values of the students, oh, sorry, of the training data as a function of the singular values of the teacher, and they get inflated by the noise, but they approach the unity line. Okay. Of course, the training error, the test error, sorry, will be lower the closer the um, training data is to the teacher, which depends on the signal to noise ratio. Okay, but now we're in place to um, understand the dynamics of the test error. So remember, I said the student, what it does is it, it, it's a singular mode, it, it's learning dynamics corresponds to a propagating singular mode detection wave that sweeps in from large singular values and, and picks them up one by one and then, and then sweeps into small singular values. So let's imagine a low rank teacher with three outlier singular values, three large singular values, and that's it. Okay, the spectrum of the input output correlation matrix will look like this. It'll have three singular values that are, that, that are the outlier singular values reflecting the teacher. Its singular modes will be correlated with the teacher, but then there'll be a bulk spectrum of noise singular values, okay? That are just noise in the training data. They have nothing to do with the teacher. So as the singular mode detection wave sweeps in, it'll learn something about the teacher, the test error and the training error will drop. And then, it, then there'll be a plateau. It'll learn something else. Both test and training will drop. Until here, uh, when it learn, starts learning about the noise and the training data, the test error will rise, but the training error will drop. Okay? That's, that's the picture. So we can verify this quantitatively. Here's an example where there's a, a rank one teacher. So there's only, and, and it's a large uh, signal to noise ratio. So there's one outlier singular value. And, and basically when the singular mode detection wave detects the outlier singular value, both the training error and the test error drop, okay? But then the singular mode detection wave penetrates into the sea of noise and the training error drops continuously, but the test error rises continuously. And this is the overfitting, okay? And uh, by the way, the, so the solid curves are theory computed from our analytic uh, uh, equations. I'm not showing you any equations in this talk, but everything that I've said can you, you can compute analytically. And the, the triangles are what we obtain from numerical simulations. Okay, so this is a rank N student, a rank one teacher. What's interesting is that the test error at the optimal early stopping time is completely independent of the number of student hidden units. Um, it only depends on the signal to noise ratio of the training data. Uh, it does, however, depend on the scale of the random initialization, right? Uh, the random initialization is just noise in the student that knows nothing about the teacher. Therefore, if it's not forgotten, it will contribute to test error, right? So, um, so we initialize from small random, uh, small random waves. Um, okay, so basically the test error at the optimal early stopping time depends only on the structure of the data, not on the architecture of the student, right? So this immediately tells you that any upper bounds that are, de that are dependent on the number of parameters of the student will be loose upper bounds of the actual test error, okay? 
or more generally anything that depends on the expressivity of the of the student. Okay. Um, Sorry, yeah, everything it, generalized. It, it, Oh, yeah. Just because you, you just paused there, so I thought maybe it's time to get in. A, there was a question a little while back, and before we get too far, sure. I thought maybe uh, sure. Nolan had a question on related to neural tangent kernel. So uh, Nolan, do you want to come uh, on they, and yeah. ask that? Sure, yeah, I can ask. Um, so yeah, you were just, um, I, I guess in some earlier slides and, and also the, the slides after that, you were talking about like convergence along like certain uh, like singular vectors, right? Um, right. In the neural tangent kernels paper, they they had like a, a section towards the end where you talked about like in the in the setting with like an infinitely wide network, um, the they show that convergence happens along the principal components of the Jacobian matrix. Right. Um, right. So like so, how does this convergence along principal components relate to the NTK's notion of it? Like, are they the same or are they totally different? I think the. Um... That's an interesting question. I haven't thought carefully about that particular relation. The um, I'd, ha I'd have to think about it to give you a very precise answer. Um, I don't want to say anything wrong off the cuff. Um, it, it might be related, like it's related to kernel machines where if the target function lies in the dominant eigenspaces of the kernel itself, then it can be learned much more easily with fewer examples and it gets learned faster and so so I think those ideas are connected. Uh, the precise mathematical connection, I, I can't give you off the top of my head. It's a good question. We can look at, we can think about it later. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, Shai had a question as well. So maybe he can come online. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I, I want to look at the perspective. I mean, you, the, we, we have generalization theory, basic machine learning in terms of uh, VC dimension. Now you, right. you make very restricted assumptions. You assume that right. the, the realizable model, you assume that the output hypothesis is proper. It's also a neural network of the same type. What do yeah. you gain for those strong assumptions? How can, how do, do your bounds compare to the classical bounds? But okay, yeah. I mean, so you are restricting a... the problem much more, but what do you gain for that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So this is a cultural difference between computer scientists and physicists, right? Um, Computer scientists like to make the least number of assumptions and create the most universal bounds possible that apply in as many situations as possible. But then the, the con of that is in the specific situations that we care about, those bounds must be, might be very, very loose. Physicists like to analyze toy problems or, or simple problems in which they can exactly compute asymptotic, in, in some asymptotic limit, the generalization error. So these are not bounds. These are, exact, these are uh, calculations that are exact in the asymptotic limit. Uh, and, and then, you know, we derive what lessons we can from them. I'll try to, uh, in the take home messages of the section of the talk, I'll try to tell you what my, what I think the lessons are. Um, and, and so maybe you can ask your question there if, if, if I don't answer it there. Um, okay. Right. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that at the end. Um, just to show you that the, the qualitative conclusions are, are um, uh, gracefully degrade with respect to various modeling assumptions. Uh, so, so here's a situation where we have uh, five layers of neurons, three hidden, th three, uh, yeah, three hidden layers of neurons, and, and we get a similar match between theory and experiment. Um, here's a situation where we change everything to ReLUs uh, or leaky ReLUs, right? So we have the same setup, but we just change the linear neuron. So we have five layers of neurons. Uh, everything in between is a leaky ReLU. And this is the qualitative structure of the training error and the test error, right? It looks qualitatively similar to what we see here, right? So of course we don't have an exact mathematical formula for these curves, but the story roughly uh, survives, uh, is robust to the addition of uh, uh, nonlinearities. Um, okay, one, one more uh, thing, of course, many of you know this paper, that this, this sort of uh, fomented a revisiting of generalization uh, in deep learning. In, the, in this paper, they showed that in the settings that are used in practice, our networks are so large that they can memorize training sets, uh, training sets uh, 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 of the same size that, that we also use in practice, but with random labels, yet they can still generalize uh, perfectly fine if the labels are not random. What they did notice, interestingly, was a slightly slower, if you randomize the labels, the learning curves are slower. Right. Um, 
Uh, so, so this is the learning curve with true labels, right? And this is the learning curve with random labels. Okay, it's not a big, it's not a big factor. It's a factor of two, two to three or so, right? And we were wondering, you know, why is that happening? It turns out you can reproduce this phenomena even in the simple toy model, and we can understand completely why that's happening. So remember that the, the learning corresponds to a singular mode detection wave that, that sweeps in from large to small values. So if there are strong input output correlations to your data, the learning curve will drop very, very early, right? On the other hand, if you randomize the data, i.e. you shuffle the data so that you destroy correlations between inputs and outputs, but you preserve the variant, the covariance matrix of the outputs and the covariance matrix of the inputs, because you destroy these correlations, but you preserve the variances, the noise grows a little bit, but you don't have strong outlier singular modes. So learning will be slower here because it takes a longer time for the detection wave to penetrate into these smaller singular values. So this is what we get from analytic formulas in our, our um, theory. We, we can reproduce this phenomenon. Unfortunately, the colors are flipped here. So this is the original data set with structure, and this is the randomized data set, and it's slower. Um, so again, I think if you destroy structure and data, you will learn slower, even if you can memorize the data. Uh, again, it's an open question. What is the structure that deep neural networks like to learn? We're actually working on a project right now, trying to figure that out. Okay, so again, the, 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 the story I think is we're all, in machine learning, we're always optimizing on the wrong landscape, right? We, we all know that we're all optimizing the training error landscape. We'd like to optimize it on the test error landscape, but we, we don't have access to it. Getting to the bottom of the training error may not always be a good idea because that may lead to a higher test error. And so we might have to do something else, either modify this landscape through regularization or stop early. Um, and these are what I think, so there's a summary and what I think, how I think this might generalize. So, um, uh, so, so basically the summary is we analytically computed the training and test error as a function of training time uh, in deep linear networks. The results qualitatively reflect the learning dynamics in deep nonlinear nets. The generalization error as a function of time depends in a sensitive but completely computable way on the initial student weight strength, the teacher rank, the teacher signal to noise ratios. But the generalization error at the optimal early stopping time doesn't depend on the student network size, as long as it's high rank enough or higher rank than the teacher. Um, these networks learn the most important structure in the data first, and then only later do they learn less important structure. So the learning trajectory matters for generalization. It explains why learning scramble data takes longer than learning structured data. And it suggests that any attempt to bound generalization error in terms of student network architecture alone, i.e. things like VC dimension, Rademacher complexity, and so forth, are likely to yield loose bounds, likely in the settings that we actually care about. The structure of the data really matters, right? So to understand generalization, I think we need a theory of the structure of the data and its impact on the learning dynamics. And in particular, generalization success in deep learning may originate through a conspiracy between data structure and learning dynamics. So I think if we really wanna understand generalization and deep learning in practice, we're going to have to make much more realistic assumptions about the structure of the data. Uh, the data can't be just random. That, and so we have to really think about what is the problem that we're solving in order to understand why we can solve it so well. Okay, um, by the way, we also use these ideas to believe it or not model uh, infant cognitive development. Uh, infants show a really uh, kind of reliable set of progression of uh, psychological phenomena as they learn concepts from when they're you know, six months to, to one year old, uh, one or two years old. Deep neural networks also show this characteristic phenomena and we could mathematically prove that linear deep networks also show these phenomena, at least qualitatively. And we could explain conceptually or mathematically derive a lot of these psychological phenomena uh, exhibited by infants. So if you're interested in that, uh, there's a PNS paper um, in 2019 that, that goes into this in, in detail. Okay, so let me, um, let me tell you next a, a fun story about the brain, which can be done very quickly. Uh, the, the, in particular, the retina, which is actually a part of your brain. So, so here's, the basic, uh, here, here's the basic idea. So your retina uh, actually is already a, 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 you know, a one hidden layer neural network. You, you have the photoreceptors that, that, that detect photons. Photoreceptors can detect individual photons. Uh, 
uh, they propagate through this neural network uh, to the ganglion cells. And each of you have 1 million optic nerve fibers in your retina. And everything you know about the visual world comes from those 1 million optic nerve fibers. How do we model the retina? Or how do we model these ganglion cells? A, a decent model, though not a perfect model, is we can model these cells by a, a space time. We can model them as a spatial temporal filter followed by a, a, a nonlinearity. The retina has multiple cell types. So if you think, if, if we want to use the language of machine learning, the retina is a convolutional uh, neural network with multiple convolutional channels. Okay? Each convolutional channel or cell type has a different spatial temporal filter and, and a slightly different nonlinearity as well. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to understand why the retina uses the convolutional filters that it does. Okay? Uh, here's an example. This is data from my experimental collaborator, E.J. Chichelinski, who records from the primate retina. Here are the four most dominant uh, uh, cell types in the primate retina, or if you will, convolutional channels. The, con the 3D space-time convolutional filters are space-time separable. So I'm showing you the spatial part here and the temporal part here. Okay, you have two cell types that have a very large receptive field. This one likes to, see, this one is an off cell. It likes to see decrements of light. This one is an on cell. It likes to see increments of light. And then you have two cells that are, have small receptive fields uh, and they come in an on and an off flavor. Um, and they have very different temporal filtering characteristics, which I'll tell you about. Okay, so it turns out that, so there are about 20 primate retinal cell types. These are the four most dominant and they comprise about 70% of all primate retinal cell types. And so we'd like to understand why uh, the primate retina uh, behaves this way, okay? Um, by the way, this is part of a bigger story in neuroscience. There are huge experimental efforts to catalog all of the cell types in the brain. A lot of money is being poured into this, partially, and it's partially driven by technology. We're doing it because we can, because of the, because of the capability of uh, single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, but there's no theory for why the brain has the cell types that it does. So we attempt to generate one of the first theories of this in the retina. Okay. So let me just review. So, so, so the, the, the midget cells that have the small receptive fields and the parasol cells that have the large receptive fields, it turns out the midget cells, their temporal filter is slow, but their, uh, the, the, the temporal filter of the parasol cells, the large ones is fast the number density of the midget cells is quite high. You have a lot of them. You have very few parasol cells. The midget cells are very sensitive. They fire very easily. Oh, sorry, sorry, they're not very sensitive. They, it takes a lot for them to fire, a lot of input for them to fire. The parasol cells are very sensitive. It takes very little input to get them to fire. Okay? The critical question we'd like to ask is why do these, why do these features co-vary the way they do? In particular, why is space and time intertwined the way they are? Why are the cells that are small in space slow in time and the cells that are large in space fast in time? Okay. The way that we decided to, to attack this problem is we, we tried to derive these properties ab initio from first principles. So the first principles are we assume that the retina is, a conv is an optimal convolutional autoencoder of natural movies. And we can vary the number of cell types or number of convolutional channels. Here's an example of a convolutional uh, neural network that just has a single convolutional channel. So there's a single filter that's replicated, a spatial filter and a temporal filter that's replicated across space. And we just assume linear decoding, right? Optimal linear decoding here. So the performance of optimal linear decoding will depend on the filter, right? Here's an example where we have a convolutional filter with two uh, convolutional channels. We match the two competing models in terms of both number of cells and overall firing rate. So we're doing an apples to apples comparison. Okay? And we ask, can you do better with two cell types than with one? Okay? Now, what, how do we put in natural movies? Well, we're just assuming a very simple linear model for now. We'll talk about the nonlinear model later. So the performance of this convolutional autoencoder depends on the statistical structure of natural movies only through its second order statistics or because natural movies are, are, are space-time translation invariant through the power spectrum, the space-time power spectrum of natural movies. So what does the space-time power, power spectrum of natural movies look like? Well, this is what it looks like. It turns out it's a power law in space and a power law in frequency. 
So this is axis of spatial frequency, and this axis is um, temporal frequency. And this heat map is the amount of power at a given spatial frequency and temporal frequency. It turns out the power spectrum has this characteristic hyperbolic shape where there are two lobes of high power, one lobe at high spatial frequency and low temporal frequency, and another lobe at low spatial frequency and high temporal frequency. Okay. Now let's see what's the next slide. Okay, to make a long story short, what we found, what we could show analytically, it, so we could solve the optimal convolutional and autoencoder problem analytically and find the optimal filters. And we showed that even if you match for total number of cells and total firing rate, you can do better with two cell types than you can with one. And the reason is specialization. One cell type will have its filter concentrating on this region of space. And the other cell type will have its filter concentrating on this region of space. Okay, so what do those two regions of space look like? Well, the cell type concentrating here is like the midget cell. It focuses on high spatial frequency, so its receptive field in space is narrow. And therefore, it must focus on low temporal frequency, so it's slow to integrate in time. It also must tile space. You can't miss any part of space. So if your receptive field is small, you need lots and lots of cells to cover space. But if you have lots and lots of cells, and if you have a limited firing rate budget, you can't have them fire very much, so they can't be very sensitive. On the other hand, the other cell type is focusing on low spatial frequency, so its receptive field in space is large. And therefore, it must focus on high temporal frequency because of the structure of natural movies. Because it has a large receptive field, you don't need that many cells to, uh, to, to tile space. And because you don't need that many cells to tile space, you can tolerate a high firing rate uh, given a limited firing rate budget. So again, we can compute all of this analytically. Um, the next thing we did is we put in the nonlinearity, and then we just numerically found the best uh, optimal convolutional autoencoder. And this is what we found. So remember, this I have already shown you. This is data from the primate retina from E.J. Chichelinsky's lab, spatial and, and temporal receptive fields. This is our, what our optimal convolutional autoencoder found. Okay. And you can see there's a very nice match between the optimal convolutional honor encoder and what evolution actually found in the primate retina. Okay. So, um, so what this is suggesting is that the primate retina has been optimally tuned by evolution to give a good uh, representation of natural movies, a good general purpose representation of natural movies. You might ask, what's the next most dominant cell type? It's turned out to something called a small bistratified cell type. That's actually specialized to process, uh, it has a blue sensitivity. So it's a very, it's color selective. And so in um, work that hasn't been published yet, we're looking now at the statistics of natural color movies and, 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 and re-deriving from first principles, the best possible autoencoder of color movies and out pops as a fifth optimal cell type, something that looks like the small bistratified cell type. Okay, and that gets us up to about 80% of, of the primate retina. Now. You can ask, well, what about other animals? In animals that are prey, it's completely different. The rabbit, for example, has 40% of its cells dedicated to detecting overhead moving objects. And you can imagine why. The rabbit is worried about overhead predators, right? Predators like primates and humans are more forward looking and more have more general purpose retina as it turns out. Um, Anyway, so that's, uh, that's that. So now we're at 1 p.m. So I actually did, I thought I could tell you about quantum neuromorphic computing, but I'll just, I'll just tell you the story in like one minute. Okay, here's the basic idea. One of my colleagues, uh, Benjamin Lev in applied physics can build a memory network, a hot field associated memory network out of a cavity QED system where the, the memories are contained in the atomic spins. So the atomic spins, spin up or spin down is like a, a neuron right, active or inactive neuron. And they can exchange light with each other and the light bouncing back and forth will flip the spins. We can show that the system behaves like a hot field neural network and we can compute its capacity, its robustness. And we find that because of the natural quantum dynamics of interacting atoms and photons, you can get a better capacity robustness trade-off than, than the hot field network. The other quantum optimizer we're looking at is a quantum optimizer made purely of photons, interacting photons. Their dynamics uh, looks like a, a spin glass dynamics, 
and 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 you can anneal the energy landscape of that dynamics and change its landscape so that you can using deterministic annealing you can solve interesting optimization problems and we can understand the energy landscape of the system it's a high dimensional energy landscape and we, we have a really nice match between theory and numerics here for this nonlinear, non-convex, high-dimensional energy landscape. And um, we can show that annealing does really well. But again, I, I won't I, I won't go into that in any more detail than that. If you're interested, these are the papers that I've talked about uh, today. Okay, and I'll stop here and take questions. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, Surya. All right, so we are going to move into question period. Uh, you can... Uh, put your questions into the chat and I'll try my best to moderate. You can also raise your hand. I do see Shai's hand uh, still raised. I don't know if that's from before because I never saw it go down. <laughs> so I'll give Shai a, a second to, <laughs> to, to uh, tell me or, if it's from before uh, or not. Uh, but I do see- No, it's uh, from before. I just don't know how to- Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, it's from before. So I do see- um, both uh, Gabriel and uh, Babita. I'm not sure who went up first. So Gabriel, uh, go ahead and Babita will go next. Uh, thanks a lot. So uh, thanks for your talk, uh, Surya. That was really, really interesting. Um, I had a question going back to the uh, the linear linear encoding network uh, for the computer vision type type task. Um, and so you, you, you went from a linear to, to a nonlinear. Um, and now- uh, did you This is for the retina part? part? Just to uh, just to better fit to the uh, experimentally observed receptive fields is that is that the utility of the nonlinearity in this case? Oh yeah. Oh, okay. So what that nonlinearity gets us is it gets us the on and the off cell types. So um, basically, like let's say you have to encode a world where sometimes it gets brighter and sometimes it gets darker, right? So then at the middle of the contrast range to be energy efficient, you don't want to have anything firing, right? Then if the contrast goes up, you want a subset of cells to fire that are the on cells. And then if the contrast goes down, you want another subset of cells to fire that are the off cells. That's much more energy efficient than having linear neurons that are always firing at some intermediate rate at, at intermediate contrasts and firing even higher at higher contrasts and even lower at lower contrasts. I see. So if you so so that's why we need the rectifying nonlinearity. So the optimization problem that we solved was we solved a um, you know just simple linear reconstruction of the movie, right? Subject to a uh, penalization or overall firing rate, or if you will, a constraint in firing rate. And then you do better if you have rectifying nonlinearities than if you don't. And and if you have rectifying nonlinearities at your disposal, like a ReLU the best thing to do is to divide the world up into on and off cells. So, so that's the reason why we, you know, we, you can't get that from the linear model. Yeah. I see. Th thanks very much. Uh -huh. So uh, Babita typed uh, her or his question, I'm not sure, Babita, <laughs> uh, into the uh, chat. So I'm going to read it out loud because uh, they say their um, uh, microphone's not working. So uh, her, thanks. Okay. So uh, Surya, how can this work be applied to solve problems in the real world? How can this uh, be applied to solve problems? In the world? So this refers to which part? Maybe you can type, I was also wondering that myself. I, I was particularly interested uh, in, in the, the first part about um, the optimal regressors to see if this has changed the way people you know, choose a, a loss function or a regularizer for their regression model. Uh, or, but uh, it looks like Babita is looking more for the retinal work. Retinal work. Oh, I see. Um, that's interesting. Uh, for the retinal work, well, you, you know, okay. So for the loss function work, uh, you know, it it kind of might justify ridge regression as a good enough thing to do if you don't have that much data. I think more empirical work is required. Uh, you know, to connect to the real world. Uh, as I said, our generative model is very simple. So, so I think more work is to, needs to be done. Uh, we're we're going to try to generalize, for example, the classification. For the retina, how can this be used to um, solve problems in the real world? Well, you know, I mean, another line of work that I didn't talk about, but, but maybe do I have the slides? Oh no, I took out the slides. 
Another line of work that we have that I didn't talk about is actually deep neural network models of the retina that are much, that are very, very accurate at predicting the retinal response to natural movies, right? So um, in fact, it predicts the retinal response to natural movies as well as you can possibly expect, given the intrinsic stochasticity of retinal firing. So you could use that uh, as a model-based way to drive the design of stimuli for retinal prosthetic devices. Right, so people are working on this in the medical school, in many medical schools out there. I have colleagues at Stanford working on that right now, where, where they're putting in retinal prosthetics into humans, where for example, if their photoreceptors, oh yeah, oh, I have the slide here. So if the photoreceptors are degenerated, but the electrical circuitry here in these ganglion cells have not, can they bypass the photoreceptors and stimulate the ganglion cells? So if you have a good model of what the retina does, you might be able to optimize the stimuli to improve the performance of a retinal prosthetic. That's one uh, real world application that we've kind of you know, talked about. Um, yeah. Okay, By so, the way, uh, like, uh, go ahead. Oh, just one really quick thing. You might ask like, hey, um, you know, when you train deep neural networks to model the world or, or you know, to solve ImageNet or do generative models, you never see cells like this in the first few layers, right? You often just see Gabor filters. So in a separate line of work, we asked, well, why the heck not? Why don't you see these things? Well, a big thing that happens between the retina and, and, and the brain is a huge information bottleneck where you have a, a many to one mapping between photoreceptors and optic nerve fibers. So what we did is we trained deep neural networks to solve real world problems. We, we put in a bottleneck. And then lo and behold, every cell before the bottleneck had, had spherically symmetric receptive fields and, and neurons right after the bottleneck have, had Gabor receptive fields. So you get that with fewer wires, right? So if you had a wiring like minimization issue in your deep neural networks for whatever reason, then this would be the optimal solution. So we showed that in another paper that actually also involves Stefan Denis. Um, Cool. So uh, Babita replies and says uh, that they were wondering about that when you mentioned the uh, the implants, retinal implants. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I had a question on the, the second chapter uh, you had presented when you're talking about the test error being independent of the number of hidden units. And uh, right. y you had gone on to talk about that uh, rethinking generalization work. And I, and I actually thought you were going to start talking about how we were thinking about model capacity uh, but but you didn't, and so I'm wondering. Like, it, it, we often talk about sort of matching a model's capacity to uh, the data, or choosing a, a optimal capacity or appropriate capacity, um, and the sort of tools that we have available to us, whether it's regularization or having um, you know, sort of choosing the right hypothesis space. And um, th that was kind of interesting. This finding of that okay, the the number of hidden units is not important. So is it, how does that how does that from a more of a maybe a practical view, like how, how do we think about appropriate model capacity? Yeah, I think uh, it's a good question. So I, I sort of had that in this, uh, you know, we, we try to parcelate whether or not we good, got good generalization error and we try to dissect it into differential contributions from different parts, like model capacity, uh, regularization, training time. And I, I I'm not sure that in every situation in which we're successful, i.e. we get good generalization error, it, it would be easily parcelatable into its individual constituents, right? Like here, right, what happened is everything intertwined together, the structure of the data, the learning dynamics, i.e. it likes to learn important structure early and less important structure later. So they conspired to get good generalization error and as a result, make the generalization or independent of model size, right? So what I think we need to do, my gut feeling is that we, we need to re, we need to, you know, to rethink generalization, we might need to rethink our understanding of the data, right? And, and then also think about, you know, of course the data determines the loss landscape, right? Because it shows up in the loss function. And then we need to think about learning dynamics on that lost landscape and what gets learned early, what gets learned later and so forth. There's nice, um, you know, visualizations out there on Twitter and so forth of, you know, learning, um, you know, learning a simple linear function with noisy data, but with a very high order polynomial, but starting from very small random weights on the polynomial. And you just don't use the full expressive capacity of the polynomial, even if you interpolate, right? 
So that has to do with the learning dynamics and, and so forth. So I, I, I just think we need to think about that more. We're, we're not there yet. Um. Okay, so uh, Shai's back. He's got another question. Yeah, one, one comment, right? I mean, this connection between the, the generalization and, and, the, and the structure of data and how it uh, eliminates the need to look at model capacity. We have examples, like the simplest example is margins. If the data no, generated, so margin is, yeah, yeah. margins, yeah. If the data is generated with margins, then we get the generalization that is independent of the dimension. Uh, so yeah, it's, so it's uh, an example of this phenomena that if we have a handle on the structure of data, we can forget about the capacity of the model. So, so I agree. The, the margin is a, is a singular is a really nice example. I, I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. That, that's one of the examples that I really like of uh, a nice generalization bound that takes note that's data dependent and so forth. Yeah, we, we need more of that, right? And uh, in a nonlinear setting, it's, you know, how do we, you know, how do we think about a generalization of margin and, and so forth? Or, or do we need something even richer than margin? Do we need to take into account the dynamics of the learning itself and the idea that uh, important structure is learned early and less important structure is learned later. And, and so, you know, is a story even richer than it's just a static function of the data itself, right? Um, I suspect that like in the general setting, it's even richer than just margin itself. Um, but that remains to be, you know, that remains to be seen. Yeah. 